I actually would take a step ahead and say it's between five think tankers. Dr. Jay Shankar is not a foreign minister, he's actually a think tanker. And he's pretending to be a foreign minister. So I am now going to ask him to, to manifest his think tank hat here and, and, and get into a conversation with his colleagues on questions of world affairs. And I think there's lots to talk about in the world today. And uh, the good news for all of you is that I will only ask one question through the entire morning. The rest of the questions are going to be amongst themselves. And, and I'm going to kick this off by actually uh, posing a question to uh, the foreign minister. Uh, foreign minister, you are someone who's um, made foreign policy more relatable to people. You have used uh, grammar, vocabulary, and even imagery uh, that uh, makes uh, people, uh, young people especially, uh, get, you know, become more interested in some very complex and complicated uh, discussions that are underway. Uh, people feel involved in foreign policy today. Uh, most recently, your book, Why Bharat Matters, uh, has um, uh, dived deep into uh, some of our oldest stories as, as children growing up in this country uh, to make complex contemporary questions uh, 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 more interesting for them. But for a foreign policy audience, what are the big takeaways from your book? From, from your recent book, what are your four or five big takeaways for the world we live in today? Uh, okay. Uh, clearly, you're taking the think tank bit seriously. Uh, so, uh, what are the takeaways? One, uh, I think the really serious problems are uh, stemming from the economic vulnerabilities of the world. Uh, so, uh, my uh, case is for re-globalization, uh, where supply chains, uh, where concentrations, where uh, digital, uh, digital vulnerabilities are better addressed. So, uh, and I uh, push that because we are really focused much more on the obvious challenges, so the, the war in Ukraine, the uh, the what's happening in Gaza, the COVID. So my point is the economic fragilities, uh, the economic uh, dependencies are actually the really serious threat to the world. The second point uh, would be uh, that uh, in a way, uh, the beware of the normal. We tend to focus on the exceptional situations. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's a daily, uh, you know, erosion or a daily danger or a daily insecurity created by the normal. So watch where the normal is going because every day in our lives, we are doing things which expose us more and more, uh, uh, particularly in a technology-dependent world. The third uh, relates to the mind games. So, you know, competition has many forms. But one of them uh, are the mind games which accompany, it's like any competitive activity. So, you know, all these uh, indexes which you get, you know, ratings, you know, how democratic are you, how good's your press, how good's your civil rights. So, this is like, uh, this is like the equivalent of sledging and cricket, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's meant to psych you before you get ready for doing anything. So I'm saying that, particularly looking at Michael. No, but in, uh, in the political sphere, the Americans are the biggest sledgers, not the Australians. Well, that, that we can discuss on a cricket aside. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the fourth, uh, which is uh, part of the reason for the title of the book, is uh, we need, we in India, need to think uh, the solutions. In fact, frankly, even the analysis for ourselves rather than kind of, uh, I mean, I'm not against uh, uh, imparted wisdom, but uh, I think we need delving into our own history, traditions, culture, and our own application of mind, uh, come up with our own uh, answers uh, to the world. So Dr. Jankar, we are going to keep coming back to you, because they are going to be asking you some questions. And uh, I would expect you to pose some um, cryptic puzzles 
for them to solve as well. So uh, let me get this going and let me first start, uh, start with Michael Pulilove, who's uh, heading a very nifty institute in Sydney, Lovi Institute. Michael, you have the first shot. All right. First of all, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank Samir and ORF for bringing us all together at this amazing bazaar of international policy. I'm really enjoying it. I'm honoured to be on a panel with this panel, but especially with Do Dr Jaishankar. We've known each other for a long time. We've had many exchanges on cricket and foreign policy. Uh, let me take this opportunity to wish India luck in the fourth test against England. I think that's, that's one thing on which Australia and India agree. That is, we like to see England lose cricket matches. Um, I also like the analogy between cricket and foreign policy because in cricket, Australia is a great power. <laughs> Um, let me, and let me come to great power competition because that's what I want to ask you about. Uh, great power competition has come roaring back over the past decade. Geopolitics is back. At the same time, wealth and power have moved eastwards towards our part of the world. And China's growth has comprised the largest uh, element of that. There's a massive concentration of wealth in China. And that same period, which has coincided with Xi Jinping's period in power, has also seen China become much more aggressive in the waters to its east and south, in its relations with its neighbours, notably India, also Australia. But in truth, China has been at daggers drawn with many of its neighbours at different times over the past decade. And I would argue that the severity of China's behaviour has seen a few effects in our part of the world. First of all, other Asian countries seeking to step up and expand their freedom of movement and to do things, make new friends, do things in different ways, because none of us wants to live in, in China's shadow. Secondly, institutional developments. For example, the elevation of the Quad. I would say both the Quad and AUKUS were made in China, Minister. <laughs> And finally, connections between capable Asian countries like India and Australia getting stronger. So there's the context. Now, let me ask you two questions about China, because I think China is at the heart of a lot of this strategic flux. First of all, let me ask you about relations between China and India. You told us at the inaugural session that we should listen, like Mr. Modi, we should, the importance of listening and reflecting. I've listened during this conference, I heard the Indian Defence Secretary say that China was a bully. I, I, I heard you say, I think, uh, that um, the biggest opposer of UN Security Council reform is not a Western country, which I guess might possibly refer to China. Um, China, I think, is a preoccupation of yours. What is the settling point of the relationship between China and India? Is there a settling point? And secondly, let me ask you about the relationship between China and Russia. The Ukraine war has pushed China and Russia together. It seems to me there's a lot of confidence here in India that eventually they will pull apart again because they're different countries with different interests. But I wonder if there's some overconfidence there. Uh, Mr Putin is, is on his high horse at the moment, but I think in the long term he understands that Russia is the junior partner in that relationship. China's economy is closing on America's economy. Meanwhile, Russia is, is in danger of being overtaken by Australia's economy. Um, Michael, what if, let me enough. finish. What okay. if the China relation, China-Russia relationship strengthens? What if it doesn't turn out in the way that India hopes? Um, okay. You know, uh, you just introduced a thought in my head, which is people say that the quad is directed against somebody. And it struck me that, yes, you know, all four of us have had problems with the UK. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, think, think about it. Uh, but uh, uh, three of us have actually kind of fought a war. Yes, yes. But uh, more seriously, uh, uh, where, you know, what would be the, uh, uh, you know, where would India, China finally find a, find a equilibrium or a balance? It will, you know, it's, here, here's the problem. Uh, both of us are rising. Uh, 
obviously at a different pace with different starting points. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Chinese started off earlier much and much more, uh, uh, you know, much more intensively and robustly than we did. Uh, but uh, it's in the nature of things that, you know, at some stage everybody flattens out, so there'll be a period where they'll be flattening out and will be growing. Uh, uh, I'm not in denial of, uh, you know, what the numbers today uh, suggest, but uh, if one looks, for example, uh, at the Goldman Sachs uh, prediction, which is that we'll both really, uh, by about 2075, end up as 50 uh, trillion dollar economy plus and will be the uh, two closest to each other. Now, the, the international relations uh, version of that issue would be if both of us are moving vis-a-vis -vis each other and vis-a-vis -vis the world, how do we construct an equilibrium? That there will be occasions when one or the other would want uh, to change, you know, to to do something to press home a particular advantage, uh, and the other will resist it. You know. uh, here's the immediate issue, which is, you know, from the 1980s, really, late 80s, uh, we had an understanding on the border, uh, precisely because it suited both of us. Uh, now, there was a departure after uh, almost, uh, after 30 years, uh, a departure on their side in terms of how they behaved uh, on the border. And there's a pushback from our side. So I, I think management, you know, arriving at equilibriums, then maintaining those, refreshing those, is going to be the, one of the biggest challenges for, for both countries. It's not going to be easy. The bit which, you know, the, the mind games which will be played would be you know, it's just between the two of us. There's nobody, the other 190 odd countries in the world don't exist in our relationship. That will be the mind game which will be played. I don't think we should play it. Because if there are other factors out there in the world which can be harnessed by me to get better terms on an equilibrium, why should I forego that right? So part of, uh, you know, uh, today, uh, uh, when I say think through your own solutions, is don't give another country, which is clearly a competitive country, a veto over our policy choices. And unfortunately, in the past, that has happened from time to time. So we should be confident enough to uh, leverage the international system to, to create the best uh, possible outcome. Your second issue, Russia, China. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, you have people whose sets of policies bring the two together. <laughs> and then you say, you know, beware of them coming together. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I mean, I, I can see the reality out there. But I think it's very much in, uh, certainly in Indian national interest, but I would suggest actually in global interest, that when Russia, you know, what's happened today with Russia is essentially uh, a lot of doors uh, have been shut to Russia and the West. Okay, we know the reasons why. Russia is turning more to Asia or to, to parts of the world which are not West. Uh, now, I think uh, it makes sense to give Russia multiple options. If we, if we railroad Russia into a single option and say, you know, that's really bad because that's the outcome, uh, then you are making it a kind of a self-fulfilling uh, uh, prophecy. So uh, today I think uh, it's important for other countries, especially in Asia, to engage Russia, to, to remind Russia. And look, Russia, Russia is, a, uh, is, a, uh, you know, is a power with an enormous... Uh, tradition of statecraft. Such powers would never put themselves, uh, you know, into a single relationship of, uh, of a overwhelming nature. Mm -hmm. it, it would go against their grain. Yeah, you know, sir, you have a right to ask him a question as well, but maybe you could pose a question once 
we've been through the first round and maybe one or two for all of them to respond to. Uh, Leslie, can I turn to you? Or maybe I should go to uh, my friend from, uh, uh, from Nigeria, uh, Ogas, uh, Osage. Uh, can you pose a question to the foreign minister? Osage heads the, the Nigerian Institute of Foreign Affairs. He was with me recently in New York. I, I, I really enjoyed his interventions. Over to you. And we were just together, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, let me thank the ORF and the Ministry of External Affairs for this invitation. It's a great privilege to be here. And I'm happy that we can continue the conversation that you set in motion in, in Lagos when you were at our institute um, two weeks ago. Now, the point is about multilateralism and, and the place of the UN um, and especially United Security Council um, in all the things. These are inflection points in world history um, when perhaps we need world bodies, world platforms um, that can help us create the kinds of stability um, that the world so very urgently requires. Now, um, this month, it will be two years uh, since the war in Ukraine um, started, and um, the UN doesn't seem to be any closer to finding a solution um, in spite of all that we're doing. And what seems to be happening in all the subjects that we're dealing with is that people are now finding alternatives to the UN. And yet here we are, uh, we insist that the UN holds the, the balance, if you like, for all the kinds of things that we're doing. The UN itself is a reflection of the power structure, of the global power structure. Um, which, you know, resonates all of the colonialities and, you know, the colonial forms and so on. So there's a school of thought that says when you ask for UN reforms, you're actually in the vortex of decolonization. Now, it's interesting that India, you know, has pushed along these lines and um, the African Union is um, fully, you know, a, in support of what India is doing. Now, the UN reforms, what do you want to see? Um, inclusivity is important, representation is important, but so is legitimacy and credibility. Now that the UN seems to be um, winning in its influence, what, what, what is driving India's point about how to reform the UN? Now, that's one. The, the second thing is, in a reformed UN, how would we ensure that the global south you know, stops being a spectator? You know, so the global south is not simply led you know, by others whose interests subordinate the interests of the global south. You know, is this something to suggest that you would have a multi-track that has the UN along with BRICS, along with all the other regional organizations and all the other multilateral platforms working together, or should we continue to balance things around the UN. Dr. Jayashankar. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting thought, and it's your thought, which I'm capturing here. I think all of you heard him say that uh, reform of UN is actually connected to decolonization. And what I guess you mean by that is so long as uh, Africa uh, and Latin America and parts of the decolonized Asia are not ref adequately and appropriately reflected. The UN is still actually a reflection of a colonial era organization. So I, I think it's a great idea. You know, I, I really think that uh, uh, you know posing the reform issue in terms of perpetuating a colonial uh, era is something which we all need to think about. Your, uh, but on the UN reform itself, uh, uh, there's actually been progress. Uh, uh, it was interesting. I think you had a pre-panel mm -hmm. uh, yes. of, uh, you know, the, there's a IGN process, the intergovernmental negotiation process. Mm -hmm. uh, the chairs of that are Kuwait and Austria. Uh, and the chairs were visiting India. Uh, they participated uh, in a panel before this conference. It was a curtain raiser, actually. Uh, yeah, formally began. 
Uh, and what is happening right now is uh, we have finally moved the needle to a point uh, where different proposed different models of how to reform the UN are being presented before the UN. Uh, so the, uh, there's a Mexico model, uh, there's a Liechtenstein model. I don't know if the foreign minister of Liechtenstein is here in the audience. She was here at the conference yesterday. I, I spoke to her. Uh, there's an L69 model of which India is also part, which is largely a global south uh, view. I think uh, Nigeria is also uh, part of it. The G4 will give theirs. Africa will present it. So actually, finally, we've reached a point where very specific views of, you know, the key elements of reform, mm -hmm. uh, that's being put, uh, uh, that's being heard in a way. Uh, now, we'll have to see, okay, after you hear everybody out, what's the next step? Where do you go? Uh, that's not uh, clear uh, as yet. But uh, we certainly, uh, you know, we, we have a strong view about the need for reform. Uh, we will put those views forward. Uh, uh, you know, when you have 200 odd members, uh, it makes sense that the body will hear everybody out and we will come to some kind of middle ground. I mean, that's what uh, diplomacy and uh, negotiations are about. But again, there's a very clever mind game being played, which is, you know, how can we reform the body unless we have consensus? That's like saying, you know, how can I take the exam because I don't know the result? Uh, so, so this is another way of perpetuating what you clearly pointed out was a, was a uh, sort of a, uh, yes, a uh, colonized uh, United Nations. In fact, the, the UN process is the, perhaps the only process where you need a consensus before you can make the first draft. The draft itself requires a consensus. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, Leslie, let me turn to you. Uh, first of all, let me echo Michael's words and, and others. That, first of all, thank you to Samir. Um, this is tremendous and it's, it's a real honor to be here. And it's especially an honor to be on a panel with, with you, Dr. Jay Shanker. Um, I want to ask a question about the G20. I was very lucky and fortunate. Samir um, gave me the opportunity to be a member of the Think 20 Task Force 7 on Reformed Multilateralism. And for me, it was a year of coming to India on multiple occasions to different parts of India to listen to a really diverse set of um, voices, not only from India, but from all of the participants from the multiple countries who engaged in that. But I also got to listen to you and many of the things that you said and in, in my suru at the final Think 20 summit, um, you, had, you, you always have very good lines. I think we all listen to you and follow <laughs> you in part for those. Um, uh, but, but one of the things, a couple of the things you said, one was um, the, the G7, and you, you paused, it is important, <laughs> but the world has moved on. And, and it's really the G20 that shows us the breadth and diversity and the diverse power, of course, although you don't use the word power, um, of, of the world. And so the G20 is tremendously important. But you also said that the, and, and this reflected my experience watching it, you said that, the, um, that India's G20 was about two things. It was about getting India ready for the world, and it was about getting the world ready for India. And I thought this was tremendously revealing of, of actually the year that I experience, had experienced. But I guess my question for you is, as you think ahead, you know, there's been, a, as Samir always says, there's been a wonderful run of Global South leadership of the G20 from Indonesia to India to Brazil to South Africa. But as we look at 2026, the picture looks different. It goes to the United States. So when we get to, to, when we get to 2026, the UN Security Council probably won't have been reformed. No, are you suggesting by 2026 the US will be Global South? <laughs> I, I do believe, Samir, um, having not grown up in New York or Washington, that, that there are parts of the Global South within the United States, and I encourage you to find them. I've traveled around India. Let's take you around the U.S. Um, but as you get to 2026, India is uh, currently the fifth largest economy. My SOAS students from India were thrilled in that moment because we were in the classroom when that was announced. The third largest military spender, maybe those um, categories will shift. Uh, probably in one direction if they do, but India's power is undeniable. Um, but it will be in a moment where at some level its sense of leadership and of Global South leadership and India being at the helm of that 
um, might not have a platform. And so I'm curious, what does that mean for, for a country that is, although again, I, I don't hear you talk about the word power very often, um, but what does that mean for a country like India that is so distinctive and so powerful? And also, what does it mean after this year, uh, this past year, where the expectation, I mean, it's extraordinary, we all know it's extraordinary. You get off the airplane and you see G20 or you see T20, it's not even in the airport. You go around the cities and that, that sort of signage, the posting, uh, has created a, an awareness um, amongst Indians of India's global leadership. And quite frankly, I cannot imagine a U.S. in 2026 having signs about the G20 in Des Moines or in, uh, or in Ohio or, or, or anywhere we, else. We can help them with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what happens when you get to that stage? So I think the second question is, are you having withdrawal symptoms? Uh, or, or are you seeing greater demand from India for global leadership? I think that's the point she's asking because you've raised the bar so high, people expect and you to go. And where do you go? And where do you go, do you go when, you're, when you're not shut out, but when you're sort of not leading in the way that you should be leading? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, my first comment would be, yes, uh, G7, you know, the G7 to G20 was, was the big change of the last decade. But what we realized was that G20 was not enough because one part of the world with more than 50 countries had been significantly shut out, which was Africa. So uh, if you see, in a way, we still call it G20, but it's actually become G21. And uh, that itself, uh, by the way, you know, in a way, it's also a lesson to the UN that if the G20 could expand, uh, show, so could the P5. Uh, but uh, the, the, it will be a process of change. You know? I mean, that's what the world is about. The world is really about uh, you know, more prosperity, more production, uh, much broader dispersal of, of uh, economic uh, and, and political uh, power in a way. Uh, so, so I can see that happening, uh, and uh, uh, my, you know, uh, when when the the sort of smoke clears uh, and people look back on this G20, it will surely be recognized uh, for the fact that the African Union membership was agreed upon. My second comment, you know, why did I say, you know, this whole thing about uh, uh, getting India ready for the world and the world ready for India? Uh, we've had foreign policy events before. We've had gatherings before. They have been largely restricted to, uh, to the formal processes of diplomacy, mainly in the capital city. Uh, I've done, you know, I've, I've attended pretty much all the G20s since 2015. Uh, I missed one, that was my gap year in the government. Uh, so uh, in that period, uh, we, we saw how others conducted the G20. And we felt this time that this was an extraordinary opportunity, one, to get the people of India, especially the young people of India, interested in foreign policy. Now, the best way of interesting people in foreign policy is to do exactly what you saw, which is go to, you know, the cities and towns across India and you know, do activities there, put up signages, uh, get them involved in a way. So, uh, if you uh, actually uh, took part in some of these activities, you had a conference going on, you know, the formal G20 meeting, but there was a lot of other stuff going on in the same city uh, at the same time. But the other part of it is, for much of the world, uh, you know, India meant Delhi. It could mean sort of the golden... Uh, triangle, the tourist triangle, it could mean Mumbai, maybe Bengaluru, uh, but that was it. Now, when you actually had G20 uh, delegates going to 60 cities, and in every case we made sure they went somewhere else outside that city, this was also uh, displaying India. So it was a very conscious effort on our part, uh, you can say, to globalize society, to, mm -hmm. to prepare. You know, when you are talking about, so, uh, the leadership, you know, what will you be doing as you go up in the pecking order? To do that, you have to prepare a society. 
You have to prepare a people for the responsibilities which come. And in a sense, we were using the G20 exercise uh, for, for that purpose. So would we, uh, would we kind of step up? Because, you know, that's really what you are asking. My sense is yes. I mean, if you look even at the last 10 years, we have been much more frequently a first responder than we've ever been before in our lives. Uh, uh, today, anything which broadly happens between, say, East Africa till about, you know, the Australia, that, that broad region, the uh, expectation is somewhere in some form India would, would respond. And, and that's actually been the record of the, of the last 10 years, sometimes beyond, you know, we, we went into uh, Turkey during the uh, earthquake there as well. So in different, you know, an India of ideas. You know, so you have a Solar Alliance, you have the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. And India, which is a kind of a, you know, and the, here there's a culture, tradition, history as well. The idea of propagating millets, for example. Don't think of it as a food fad. The millets is the only way by which global grain production can be significantly increased in a short time given the natural you know, usage of resources that we have. So it could be millets, it could be yoga, it could be solar, it could be terrorism, it could be black money. You today see an India which is, which is really uh, you know, uh, pushing and, and trying to get itself and its ideas on the global stage. And what about the pressure from young people who now want more from you? Every time you are traveling, every time you are at work, they expect miracles. Sorry, I can tell you that. They expect miracles from you. They expect the extraordinary from you. The expectations have been raised. How do you deal with that? I mean, like, you know, how do you respond to that kind of pressures? Because you've got so many people interested in foreign policy, you know, everyone has a view. Uh, well, that's good, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, there'll be more Samirs coming out uh, of that process. Uh, so, uh, okay. the, you don't want more Samirs, but let me turn to Bruce Jones. <laughs> I'm dazzled by the prospect, actually. So, uh, thank you for having me here. Some, uh, and, Terrific to be on the panel with you, Dr. Shai Shankar, and with the, with the rest of the crew. I, I do notice I'm, I work for an American institution. I am an American. I'm also Canadian. Leslie works for a British institution, but she's secretly also an American. So I notice that Samir only has former colonials uh, on the <laughs> stage for this, for this discussion, which may be appropriate. Look, I, I wanted to ask you about India's leadership here. I mean, we have some pretty serious challenges ahead of us. Uh, deterring great power war, managing great power competition, I think a much deeper conceptualization and driving of re-globalization than has been discussed uh, so far, uh, driving a deeper reform and adaptation of the, of the treaty-based order that can, so it can survive to some degree. Uh, no one state can do all of that. India has important roles to play. But there are other actors that I think that can contribute, the Brazils, the Indonesias, the Turkeys, et cetera, as well as some of the European and, and Western mi middle powers and major powers, the Canadians, Australians, et cetera, Spain. What prospects do you see for greater collaboration among that set of actors, the kind of the major powers that aren't the ones who are really driving great power competition? Uh, I mean, you're an actor in great power competition too, but you're not the primary drivers of it. What, what scope is there for collaboration among that kind of group of major powers, major and middle powers that have deeply vested interests in the survival of the system, even if the system needs to change quite a lot? Uh, so you're talking here of the P5? No, I'm saying how do you think about collaboration among He's the kind of set of G2 actors be below Minus that? G2. You remove the G2, yeah. can the others... Uh, create safe spaces for globalization, for international relations. And for managing great power competition. Uh, look, you know, you have, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure the G2, uh, I mean, the G2 will always be a concern. I'm not sure how, how realistic a concern it would be, uh, given, given the way things are going. Then you have, in a sense, at least from a UN perspective, the P3, uh, the, uh, uh, the non-G2, and then you have this set of, you can say, middle powers, upper middle powers. Uh, one neat category would actually be the G20 countries, 
uh, and but you know I, I <laughs> also give uh, due to due weight to Nigeria here. But let us say there are those eight about rough, roughly uh, ten odd countries which would be uh, G20 G20 countries of regional influence. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, my, my sense is you're going to see both lateral and to some degree uh, vertical uh, collaborations. Some of the collaborations would come from pre-existing architecture. I mean, you have alliances. Uh, so uh, the alliances or groupings, I mean, the EU allows a lot of countries to coordinate. The NATO allows a lot of countries to coordinate. Australia, Japan, uh, by virtue of their treaty, of their treaty uh, alliances, uh, treaty relationships do that. The interesting ones would be the, the loners, in a way, the ones who are not embedded in a pre-existing structure. And you can see that in different ways they are both expanding options, but also uh, uh, trying to forge something common. I, I give you a few examples of it. If you look at, uh, say, uh, BRICS expansion, uh, some of the countries that showed interest and have actually uh, moving in that direction, I mean, take something like Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is clearly widening its options. The UAE is widening its options. But at the same time, these loner countries, these independent countries, uh, through initiatives like IMEC, are working you know, so, so they're, they're also trying to forge, uh, I would say, uh, common ground on a, on a particular set of issues. So you're going to see, you know, uh, there would appear to be contradictory trends. To my mind, they are not. I, I think, it, to me, it's more like the natural diversity of the world finally escaping the clutches of a, of a discipline imposed after the Cold War. So the Cold War really, uh, you know, compelled or, you know, incentivized a whole lot of countries to come together very tightly. That's now loosening up. There'll be consequences. Uh, a lot of countries will now, uh, you know, try to have multiple options. And then once, even as they do that, they will form combinations of their own. And that's really going to make international relations very interesting. Is India willing to lead that effort? Is Are India you willing, willing to lead, to lead, that, lead effort? that effort? No, I don't think anybody can lead that effort. You know, uh, my, my, my sense is uh, you'll get combinations. We would try to be involved in as, you know, a lot of foreign policy is to be involved in as many of these enterprises and initiatives and groupings as possible. So it's a, it's a, so a sort of... Uh, uh, you know, in, in my book, I've, I've actually described it as making friends and influencing people. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so how are you ideally omnipresent, omni-relevant? Uh, and that's also today, I, I would say, a new way of conducting foreign policy. So, Dr. Jay Shankar, if I was to ask you to pose a question to these very fine minds, and give them, say, 30 seconds or 40 seconds to respond to that one inquiry that you would like to hear from or seek their input on. What would that be for them? Well, I think for Michael, I mean, from an Indian perspective, the real issue as we look forward at India-Australia is, in a way, how much uh, Australia is Indo-Pacific and how much Australia is Western. I, I think that's the duality which most people would be interested in. Well, let me, let me answer that. Let me say, I had one, two, ma, 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 yeah. ma, Michael, I, I'll, I'll give you your turn. Okay. But, and for Leslie? No, let him answer that, I'll think of it. Okay. I'm running out of time, and hence okay. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm, uh, sure. I'm going to give uh, Michael the last word to come because he started first. But do you have questions for any others that we can take and then go to them and close? Well, uh, I, I think uh, uh, what I would, in a sense, uh, urge you to articulate, uh, because uh, given Nigeria's uh, uh, today uh, importance, uh, is uh, within, you know, uh, we tend to talk about Africa, 
but, but I mean, you, you look at Nigeria, which is a significant power in its own right. What would be the, the next set of countries coming up? How do they plan their rise? Because that is something which is, uh, which is clearly uh, uh, awaiting you. Uh, and to Bruce? Uh, Bruce. 2026 America. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted to ask him a Canadian question, but then I get into trouble. <laughs> So, so, I just want to confirm that I have your good wishes that Indo-Canadian relations would continue to improve. <laughs> okay, so Bruce, that's a, that's a cue for you to respond to something and, uh, and what about Leslie? Yeah, you know, I, I would be really curious because you, you clearly got immersed very deeply in the G, G20 uh, experience. Uh, so I, I would be curious to get that sense from you and in a way to Michael also because Lowy had put out a study I think on how young Indians think uh, about foreign uh, policy. are uh, interested in foreign policy because I think that's really today, you know, uh, in the next, in the coming elections, uh, almost 90 million young Indians would be voting for the first time. That's how significant their impact is going to be in this country. So I'd be very interested from your travels to get that impression, you know, what was the impact? What do you see? Because I'm giving you my version of what I tried to do. Did I succeed? Okay. You know, did we really get people interested? Great. So I think let's, let's start with Bruce. Uh, come to you, uh, Osage, then come to Leslie and I'll give Michael the final word. Uh, you all have uh, 45 seconds to one minute each for your final interventions uh, this afternoon. Uh, after which I'll start singing, so you should avoid that. So but Bruce, let's start. As a, as a Canadian, uh, look, the, the thing I would raise is the really important role uh, through the Cold War and in the post-Cold War that was played by major powers and middle powers in quiet diplomacy to help the great powers manage de-escalation and in innovation in the multilateral space, the creation of new instruments like peacekeeping, et cetera, was always done by major powers or middle powers working quietly. Canada did that, Australia did that, uh, India did that at an earlier phase. And I think that that role is extraordinarily important in the years to head. So it's something to, to reflect on and look at. Sagi? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, when you talk about emerging countries in Africa, and you say, after Nigeria, um, which are the other countries? You can have a good lineup, um, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco. All of these countries are there. But there is something that you know, makes Africa a little exceptional. It is the consensus building um, that is traditional to Africa as a value. And so the African Free Trade Agreement, for instance, um, provides a very strong, you know, cement for all of that continent. And you would find even in the, um, uh, the BRICS, you have found it necessary to admit AU uh, rather than another country, for instance. I think it's a reflection of how very strong the African consensus is, you know, have been over mm -hmm. the times. And you see what the regional bodies are doing, SADC, the IGAD, the ECOWAS, and so on. So it's not simply and only about individual countries emerging anymore. So we have to be simultaneous you know, in dealing with Africa. We're dealing with you know, these regional organizations alongside you know, those powers. And you will find that the evolving powers in Africa are themselves seriously uh, located within those regional frames. Mm. Excellent. Leslie. Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, undoubtedly my experience um, is, would suggest that you succeeded um, on the back of a very strong base of young uh, people, not least the Rizina young fellows, but really there is an extraordinary base on which to build. If you can actually get those 90 million young people to turn out and vote, um, that would certainly be a level of success that the democracy that I'm most familiar with struggles with getting its young voters. 90 million. 